Welcome to our little conversation on poker history. I would like to take this moment to thank Bravo Von Mueller for without his generous contribution, this video would not be possible. Again, this is poker history, and we're talking about the big game. Poker, that is. The big game in poker. So, you've probably never seen this t-shirt before. To my knowledge, it's the only one in existence. It was made about 40 years ago. 40, yes. Not very many people are still around today that played in the big game at the Silverbird. As you can see there in the, on the t-shirt picture, you've got Doyle Brunson. And to the right of Doyle Brunson, you have Eric Drake. These are the two men we're going to be talking about today, or more specifically, the casino that they ran their poker room in. The poker room was called the Ten Deuce Poker Room. Now remember, back then, the casinos would lease out space to the poker men who ran the poker room. So the casinos didn't actually run the poker room. They just leased it out. And then you had the poker guys who ran the room and the way they felt necessary. You've probably heard about in the 60s and 70s the snatch games where the dealers would take a little extra or maybe even a lot extra and throw it down the box for the house. Well, we're not talking about snatch games today. Again, we're talking about the big game. Now, let's, uh, let's start from the beginning, okay? In the beginning, the, the big game would have been at the Horseshoe, Binion's Horseshoe downtown, during the World Series of Poker Tournament. you got to realize, in the beginning, the Horseshoe never had a poker room year-round. No, they just held the World Series of Poker Tournament, and then you had some of the biggest games ever during that time. It's uh, no, One thing to note is they would have this uh, tournament during... Uh, the springtime. You know, you know, you notice it now that the corporations run it in the summertime when it's hot as hell. But back then, when the horseshoe was running it, uh, the horseshoe, of course, Binion's invented it. They did not want to have a tournament when it was real, really hot out there because they they appreciated the poker players. The poker players were their friends, so they had it during the you know when the temperature was more reasonable. In Las Vegas. Okay, so let's get back to it. Uh, and then you had the big games at the Dunes, and then it moved over to the Aladdin, and then the big game moved to the Silverbird. And that's why we're talking about this because I, I'm here to show you this T-shirt. And a lot of people may not know that the big game was at the Silverbird. Silverbird, and then after the Silverbird, I believe it went to the Nugget, and then from the Nugget. It went to the Mirage. The Mirage opened up in 1989. And then from the Mirage, it would have went over to the Bellagio, where it is still running today. And how can you talk about the big game without talking about Doyle Brunson? Well, you cannot. As you can see, his picture is right there. He was there at the Dunes. He was there at the Silverbird. And his crew kept on running all the way to the Bellagio. I mean, you're talking about some of the biggest millionaires in the world who want to play poker. They make a phone call to the poker room, and then the poker room manager calls up Doyle Brunson, and Doyle Brunson and his crew got together. You've probably heard of Chip Reese. Uh, unfortunately, Chip Reese is no longer with us, one of the best poker players that ever lived, and he was part of that crew. Now, I must say this, that when the poker games, when the big games were running at the dunes, the money was, the money was easy. And, uh, and, of course, there was lots of money to go around. And you cannot really talk about this big game without talking about, you know, the mob was around here. In the 1970s, Tony Spilatro and his crew, they were here. And they're not going to let any easy money get by. So Tony Spilatro would actually extort it some some money from the uh, players from the professional players who were making a, a ton of money at the dunes they were expected to give uh, Tony Spilatro a cut I believe it, it they didn't actually hand the money off to Tony Spilatro he was too good for that he uh, he would use one of his uh, 
one of his underlings, uh, I think it was Mike O'Connor. Mike O'Connor would actually pick up the money, and um, that's the way things were in the 1970s. Well, we know why Las Vegas was picked as a gambling location. It's close proximity to California. California has all kind of military bases, military installations, and you know military men used to like to play poker. They still do, and they come out to... So like it might be this might be a good time to say that when people came to Vegas in the late 70s and early 80s I even came out here in the early 80s when when I was uh, I was in the military in California and when you got to Las Vegas and you played in the poker room I must say that there was at least one seven card stud game in every poker room this is a, something that some of the young guns don't know today uh, every poker room had seven card stud, and be, that's because the people back east loved kept seven card stud. That's what people played back east, and of course, with these guys back east are going into the military, that's the game they know. So, if you came to Las Vegas in the late seventies, early eighties, you were able to play seven card stud. There was a game available, and that game is. In my opinion, it's a it's a better game. It takes more skill to play seven card stud, but that's just another opinion. Um, now, it was not until 1986 that's when I moved to Vegas that I got hooked on Texas Hold'em. It's fast and furious action to boot. So, now the reason why I mention this is uh, you know going back 35, 40 years ago when the people moved here, when guys moved here, most of them were not experts at Texas Hold'em. But after moving to Las Vegas, and you see uh, the majority of the games were Texas Hold'em, say like every poker room would have uh, maybe two Texas Hold'em games running and one seven-card stud, you know, if it was a small poker room. That was with, like, the, uh, the percentage-wise, uh, two to one. And people would see the big pots in Texas Hold'em, and they get in the game, and before you know it, you're hooked on Texas Hold'em once you move here. It's something to realize, uh, you know, that's the way it was back then. Now, also, like I said before, uh, downtown Horseshoe did not have a poker room in the 1970s or most of the 1980s. Now, like like I said, when I got here and I was playing uh, a Texas Hold'em, 1986, I would play at the Mint. They had a game at the Mint, the, the Golden Nugget, Poker Palace, the Showboat, Caesars, Dune, Sahara. The Aladdin, Stardust, I mean, the list goes on and on. There was many, many nice places to play poker, but there was no, it was no no limit poker. It wasn't no limit. Now, I'm talking about day-to-day -day, uh, games. I'm not talking about the big game right now. I'm just talking about normal, uh, you go in the poker room and you're looking for a game, and uh, there was no no limit. Of course, everybody realizes it was limit back then. Now here's what happened. In 1988, 1988, the Binions bought the Mint Casino next door. And then they opened up a poker room. After they after, after they bought the Mint uh, Casino, they gave them more room and they had a nice little poker room right in the middle there. I played there all the time. When I get off work, I was a dice dealer. I got off work, I played every night at the Horseshoe. Lots of action. Many big famous players would stop in and play. I mean, occasionally they had the uh, 2040 rolling, 2040. And in that 2040 game, you would have guys like uh, uh, Johnny Moss. Now, remember, when we start talking about the big game, Johnny Moss was in that big game in the 70s. You had uh, Puggy Pearson, Amarillo Slims. You had everybody coming in there. Even, uh, even Stu Unger would come in. I mean... I mean, Stu Unger wasn't always playing. He wasn't always up to playing. He was had a drug problem, but he would always stop in. Enough of that. Let's get back to the big game. Okay, now we're going to go back to the late 70s, uh, early 80s. On the Strip, not far from the Riviera, was a casino called the Silverbird. The Silverbird. Now, the site is now where the unfinished billion-dollar Fontainebleau is standing. Yes, today... If you come to Vegas, you'll see a huge billion-dollar hotel structure. It's unfinished. It used to be called the Fontainebleau. They changed the name again. It probably won't be opened up for another five or six years. Okay, but that's 
where the Silver Bird was. Now it opened up, the Silver Bird opened up in 1948 as the Thunderbird. In 1976, Major Riddle acquired the property and he changed the name to the Silver Bird. And uh, now Major Riddle, that's a picture of him right there. He's right beside Elvis Presley. Now uh, Major Riddle is going to be a big player in our story today about the big game. You see, Major Riddle, was uh, he was the owner of the Dunes. He had lots of points in the Dunes. Now, he had a big gambling problem. He loved poker, but he wasn't very good at it, and he lost millions and millions of dollars playing poker. Now, here's the interesting thing about what happened. Like I said, Major Riddle acquired the Thunderbird in 1976. He changed the name to the Silverbird. But by 1981, I believe Major Riddle was having health problems, and he was losing money there. He had lots of tax problems, and they actually shut the Silver Bird down in 1981. I actually knew a cocktail waitress who worked graveyard shift, and the managers called her and said, don't bother coming in tonight. They're going, they're going to lock everybody out at midnight. So they actually did shut the Silver Bird down. For a short while because Major Riddle was not only sick but he had lost millions of dollars. Now he still owned, at that time, he still owned about 30% of the dunes. Even though he was losing millions playing poker, he still kept 30% uh, of the dunes up to the day he died. Now uh, it stayed closed for a short amount of time and then Ed Torres uh, bought it. I think he bought it out of bankruptcy uh, auction and then uh, it was renamed the El Rancho. Now, not to be confused with the original El Rancho, Vegas, Vegas, that burned down across the street years earlier. But again, in the uh, 1981, the El Rancho it was renamed the El Rancho. It did not stay open for long either, either, and then they shut the El Rancho down. It was a bad location. The property was boarded up in 1992. So let's get back to the t-shirt. Again, you got uh, Doyle Brunson there on the left and Eric Drake on the right. Now, Eric ran the World Series of Poker Tournament from 1973 to 1988. And he came up with the concept of satellites, satellite games, to help you get into the bigger events. Now, eventually, Eric Drake would lose his gambling license and lose the privilege of running a poker room he had to move to California but you got to realize from 1973 he was running the World Series of Poker tournament so he was well known in 1976 and remember uh, Major Riddle purchased the Silver Bird and uh, he hired Eric Drake and Doyle Brunt and I'm, I don't know if that's the right word hired them but he brought them in because remember the casino leases out the space and, of course, uh, Eric Drake and Doyle Brunson were on the license to run the poker room. This was at the Silverbird. Now, the whole, the whole reason why Major Riddle did this is he wanted to bring the big game from the Aladdin over to the Silverbird. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, they named the, uh, the poker room was called the Ten Deuce Poker Room. So let's get back to Major Riddle for a moment. Now, Major Riddle... By 1976-77, he had been losing a lot of money. He was a degenerate gambler. And I think he had lost a lot of his points in the dunes. Now, some people say he lost the dunes. That's not correct. At the time of his death, Major Riddle still had 30% ownership in the dunes. So he, he did not lose everything. But he did lose quite a bit of points. Remember back then, the owners had points in the casinos. Points were like a percentage. And... Um, so anyhow, the big game moved from the Dunes to the Aladdin and then to the Silverbird. Now, some people say the Aladdin was the birthplace of the big game. Others say the Dunes. I mean, but here's what I can tell you. The Aladdin was controlled by the Detroit mob, and the Dunes was a Chicago outfit. Now, uh, they were all working with the Teamsters Pension Fund bankroll back then. I mean, that's how they built these places. They... They were using, it was like free money. Use the, team, use the Teamsters money, how sweet it was. So let me, let me bring up uh, Johnny Moss for a moment. Johnny Moss was a gentleman. He was a great poker player. I actually played with him, not only in the 
uh, live games, but I played with him in some tournaments at the Four Queens. But Johnny Moss would play against Major Riddle in the big games. Now, Johnny Moss did not need to cheat to beat Riddle. No way, no how. Let me tell you, that's a fact. I mean, now some of the other players in the big game, the big game, they were known to cheat in cahoots with the dealer. But let me get this out of the way right off the bat. Johnny Moss would have none of that. I mean, he was a gentleman gambler with a dash of temper, and there's no way that he needed to cheat to beat Major Riddle. He was a class act and one of the greatest Texas Hold'em players out there. A little extra information on Major Riddle that connects with the poker room. you got to remember also back then poker players were considered borderline criminals. They were like wise guys back then. And in 1975, before he purchased the Silverbird, uh, Major Riddle was investigated for giving Tony Spilatro red carpet VIP treatment at his casino. And he also loaned uh, Spilatro money, um, allegedly. Okay, but uh, Riddle was cleared of all those charges. I mean, Major Riddle, was he was protected by the cabal. And everybody knows who the cabal is. I mean, the cabal, uh, these included men who picked who would be on the Federal Reserve Board of Directors. I mean, the, the cabal, these, men, these are men with more power than the President of the United States. So uh, Major Riddle had no problems with the authorities. Now, Major Riddle also, he had dated Virginia Hill. And everybody knows that Virginia Hill uh, later would become Bugsy Siegel's girl. But when M Major Riddle was dating Virginia Hill, of course, that during that time, Virginia Hill would think up some pretty clever ways of milking him. But uh, for all the money that Virginia Hill milked out of uh, Major Riddle, all that money went to Joe Epstein. Joe Epstein was her real boyfriend at the time, and he was an Al Capone bookmaker from back in the Chicago days. So, you know, the names, it was a small town. Let me tell you this much about Vegas. Even up into the mid-80s and late 80s, it was a small town. Everybody knew everybody, and it was, uh, it was surreal. Okay, so let's get back to the Silver Bird and the big game now. Like I said, officially... Uh, Doyle and Eric were had the license to run the 10 deuce poker room there. They brought the big game. Now, it was only open from around, I think, 1977 to 81 when they closed it down. And, uh, okay, so after that, in 80, from 81 to 88, Eric Drake, uh, he still ran the World Series of Poker up until like 88. And then... Um, in 89, when uh, Steve Wynn opened up the Mirage, uh, Eric Drake did go to the Mirage Poker Room in 89. And I think he kind of closed his career out over there. Okay, but I kind of got ahead of myself there. Let's go back to 1981. Um, I forgot to mention Jimmy Knight. Jimmy Knight also worked at the Silverbird. I think he had a pretty big job there either shift boss or casino manager or whatever it was. It was pretty big. But i got to mention this because Jimmy Knight had a huge amount of influence over Eric Drake and um, in his whole poker career. So like in, so in 1981, when the Silver Bird closed down, you had, there was action at the Golden Nugget. I mean, there was big games at the Golden Nugget. I can remember going in there. And these guys, I mean, I think, I thought they were drug dealers. I don't know, but they... They would stack $100 bills up on the poker table in the game. And then they'd, they'd go off and eat dinner. This was the strangest part. When I hit Vegas and I would go in and I, you know, I played at the Golden Nugget. I played in a smaller game. But I'm playing in a smaller game. I'm looking over there next table. It's a big game. And this guy's got stacks of $100 bills six inches high. And then they go off to dinner like nothing. I mean, this is, this is the way it was. So there was the big game was there was big games there at the Golden Nugget all the way up until you know like from 81 to 89 and what happened in 89 of course was the Mirage opened up and then um then you had some big games you even had guys like uh, Carl Icahn everybody knows the millionaire Carl Icahn and other millionaires they would actually play the big game at the Mirage occasionally uh with the Doyle Brunson team and then again it moved over to the Bellagio 
And this is the history of the big game. So let me close this video out with saying this. Yes, there were some shady things that went on in Vegas in the 70s and 80s, not only in the poker room, but in the casino pit. For example, you had uh, some of the casinos, the dealers would go shift for shift. You know, sometimes, right now, all the casinos, I believe, are 24 hours. 24 hours, they add all the tips up, and they divvy them up to all the dealers. And the dealers don't really work that hard like that. But back in the 70s and 80s, and I worked at a, a shift for shift job at the Landmark. I worked as a, a dice dealer at the Landmark, and whatever we made on that shift, we split it up. Now, you're probably saying, where the hell am I going with this? How does this have to do with poker? What has to do with everybody's going to say, we know we're talking about Eric Drake and he lost his license. And many shady things were done back then. And I'm just going to give you an example. Say like uh, on a shift for shift job in the casino pit, the guys that would, who there had a couple guys who at the end of the shift, they would count up all the tip money. And then they would divvy it up to all the dealers on that shift. And I can tell you in a lot of the casinos, the casino manager, or actually the assistant shift boss, the assistant shift boss was usually the guy who picked the two dealers to count out the tokes. And for some reason, they always picked a druggie, a guy on drugs, to count out the toke money. And you probably know where this is going. There was They always were skimming off a little bit of money. The, the, the druggie would skim off some money. The assistant shift boss got a cut. Probably the uh, the shift boss got a cut. I mean, anytime you had huge amounts of money that was rolling around and you had a couple guys to count it out, there was always something shady going on. Now, here's how I'm going to end this story. Nine times out of ten, these people got caught. If you were skimming money from the dealers or skimming money on any situation, nine times out of ten, you got caught. What happened was, if the authorities were brought in, okay, you could lose your license but here's how they get you okay you they would they would take away your license and take away you know you don't have the privilege of working in the business anymore but where they get you is when you are skimming money and it doesn't matter where you skim the money in the casinos guess who comes knocking on your door the IRS the IRS says we found out that you were skimming some money stealing some money use whatever word you want and guess what we think you owe us this much money in taxes so where they always get you back in the day I don't think this really happens anymore but in the 60s 70s and 80s when you were doing something shady and you got caught where you really paid was the IRS came to you and say you know you owe us this amount of money and of course you did lose your license and the privilege of working in the business so I hope you uh, enjoyed this little segment because this is Las Vegas history.